A very quick run through some of the work that uh, my colleagues and I here at QUT are doing uh, to investigate the interconnections between social media and the news, uh, particularly when it comes to the spread of information, misinformation and disinformation. So I'm very much presenting on my colleagues here um, uh, and uh, I will provide an overview of some of the work that's going on within the center. Um, in this presentation, which I'll also share as slides, um, uh, there will be a number of, of links uh, to further information, a number of citations for some of the research that we've published already, uh, as well as some embedded videos that uh, you may watch at your leisure. Uh, here's a little bit more about the center. And again, you can uh, see the full details also at the URL uh, for the Digital Media Research Center. In addition to the DMRC itself, I should also say that we're part of a larger center of excellence in Australia the uh, Center of Excellence for Automated Decision-Making and Society, and much of the work that I'm talking about here is also very much part of what that center does, which is a multi-institution, uh, multi-state, uh, um, and in fact, international organization as well. So quite a bit of the work I'm talking about here really uh, relates to this as well, which is about algorithms, AI, and automated decision-making in society. All right, um, so uh, let me go through a number of, of key areas here. And I want to start actually with the connection between news and possibly legitimate information um, uh, as it's being shared on social media. And uh, uh, here I want to talk particularly about some work that uh, I've done with my colleague Tobias Keller. Um, again, there's a video that you can watch at your leisure as well in more detail and paper that we've published. Um, uh, where we're interested in the diffusion of news across social media. And this is prompted to some extent by uh, the work um, that's been published over the last few months and years um, that seems to suggest that um, um, misinformation, disinformation spreads more quickly than uh, genuine information. That, as the tagline for this article here says, a lie spread faster than the truth. And we think that's actually problematic in its, in its simplicity. Um, there's a lot more that needs to be investigated. There's a lot more detail, a lot more context that needs to be taken into account. So the idea, idea that falsehoods always diffuse more quickly than the truth, uh, we think is very problematic and not sustainable. Um, so for our purposes, what we've done is to uh, investigate the transmission of both legitimate news stories and stories from fringe media across Twitter. Um, uh, and uh, we've, we've taken the approach that you see on the screen here. So we're interested in individual stories and how they disseminate on Twitter. So here for a story from the public broadcaster in Australia, the ABC, um, where it, it gets shared uh, at, uh, in its first tweet that shares the URL. And um, then of course, over time, more and more tweets are sharing that URL. So by the end, and we take an endpoint here of 60 days after the first share, we've reached 100% of um, the total count of tweets that are sharing this URL. So we can plot this curve. We've plotted it here logarithmically for this one story to see how over time it's actually distributed on Twitter. We can then do this for all the stories in a given time frame that the ABC has published. And we see that obviously some stories disseminate more quickly. Some stories might be more short lived and um, have, a, have a briefer and quicker uh, uh, journey to full sharing. Some stories are sleeper stories that take a lot longer to reach 100% uh, off sharing. And, and then finally, of course, we can do this for multiple outlets as well, both Gen uh, genuine news outlets as well as fringe outlets. And here we're, dis we're combining uh, data from two uh, larger data sets that we've been gathering for some time. The Australian Twitter News Index, which tracks gen genuine legitimate Australian news outlets and the fake news index, we which tracks uh, fringe and fake news sites. And so we can see on average how for these different sites, uh, news diffuses on Twitter. Uh, here, for instance, we see that the ethnic sites, the legitimate Australian news sites, uh, are mainly in the midfield. So they're neither faster nor slower necessarily than um, fringe and fake news sites. We see that a handful of, uh, of fringe news sites disseminate uh, somewhat more quickly than uh, genuine news sites on Twitter uh, on average. And we see also that some specialist sites disseminate more slowly on Twitter uh, than uh, the average, and that's particularly for specialist sites like the legitimate news site, The Conversation, which is in scholarly publications, or hyperpartisan sites like Judicial Watch, which disseminate much more slowly um, than is the case for ordinary sites. Um, so we're seeing here both slower and, and faster dissemination of these sites on average over time on Twitter, 
Um, and uh, that, I think, is a significant departure from the idea that um, the truth always lags behind falsehoods as, as they disseminate on Twitter. So we cannot sustain that from our data. Um, we're looking here, of course, at a particular context, a particular time frame. One thing that we're very keen to do is to extend this further over longer time frames, to extend the analysis, to also look at particular contexts and particular stories. For instance, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, to see how all of this disseminates ultimately over time in the longer term and what the uh, systemic differences, if there are any, are between legitimate news sites and uh, fringe or fake news sites. Okay, so that's getting us already to the, the question of information disorder, what's called fake news, misinformation, disinformation, malinformation are better terms. And uh, here again, I want to talk about some of the work that uh, we are doing in the center. Again, some of the work that I've been involved in, that my colleague Tim Graham particularly has been, uh, has been leading as well. Again, there is a video that uh, you may watch at your own leisure uh, and some, some published articles already as well. Um, and what we're interested in here particularly is inauthentic behavior. Uh, so Tim Graham, for instance, has taken some of the work that I've just shown and looked particularly at any evidence of coordinated activity of accounts that uh, tweet the same URLs within very uh, short uh, moments of time at the same time repeatedly or that uh, retweet the same URLs also within very very brief periods of time repeatedly. Um, and uh, here's a graph of a core, what he calls a core retweet network. So a network of accounts that retweet the same URLs multiply uh, within very brief, uh, brief periods of time within seconds ultimately. And we're seeing here, for instance, in this particular case, that there is a network around Judicial Watch that seems to be uh, co-retweeting um, its links uh, at, at some point. Uh, we can look at this in some more detail. For Judicial Watch, for instance, uh, here we're seeing the core tweets, so accounts that all tweet the same content uh, within seconds of each other. In this case, as it turns out, though, this is an accidental core tweet network of accounts that actually repost what the Donald Trump account used to post, not, not anymore, of course. Um, and therefore all posted the same link to judicial, judicial Watch once Donald Trump had posted it, and they all did so within uh, 60 seconds of each other. We also saw a network actually around the conversation of accounts that uh, were all named after cities in the, in the United Kingdom. And again, these accounts all seem to tweet the same links to the conversation within a very brief period of time. And that seemed like um, inauthentic, uh, spammy behavior at least. Um, Tim has then taken this further and looked also at larger uh, sets of data around the 2016 debate night. Here he's, he's graphed accounts that, that co-retweeted the same accounts within one second of each other, at least twice. So within a very brief period of time. Um, and we're seeing here networks of co-retweeting um, that, uh, that existed during this time, which is almost certainly um, problematic activity and in fact uh, the accounts shown here in red were, were subsequently suspended so it's very clear that, that Twitter itself also thought that something was amiss here. Um, Tim did the same again for the debate night 2020. Here actually he's, he's looked at accounts that co-retweeted within 60 seconds of each other at least twice so a longer period of time and again we saw some significant networks that emerged from that analysis. In fact Tim and his colleagues now have also released a tool uh, that identifies this kind of coordination uh, uh, for Python. So again, uh, I encourage you to explore uh, that tool and, and that code uh, for yourselves as well. Okay, moving on a little bit further here from simply sharing uh, possibly in an inauthentic way content uh, uh, via Twitter and via Facebook. Uh, here we're looking more specifically at content that, that uh, uh, discusses conspiracy theories. Again, there's a video and there's some links uh, to further publications here um, that I encourage you to have a closer look at. Um, what we're interested in here in particular is the conspiracy theory, which is entirely inaccurate, of course, and I, but I do want to stress this, there's nothing to it, um, that uh, the coronavirus was somehow related to the presence of 5G radiation. Uh, in Wuhan and in other places, um, and some celebrities have uh, at times endorsed this, uh, this theory, um, which in the end led to arson attacks on cell phone towers in, in the UK and elsewhere, um, which uh, also led to governments having to respond to this kind of mis- and disinformation, which also led to protests here in Brisbane, but also in many other cities around the world um, that warned of the supposed dangers of 5G and linked this to a pandemic. 
Um, and ultimately also we've seen similar activities also in a coordinated fashion, not so much around the 5G conspiracy theory, but around the, the bioweapon conspiracy theory that, that the coronavirus was meant to be a bioweapon, which again is entirely inaccurate, of course. Um, so we're, we're looking here at these sorts of conspiracy theories. And uh, um, here for this particular study, we've tracked the incidence of posts that uh, discuss these conspiracy theories over time for the first few months of 2020. Um, and in fact, we saw that there are a number of very distinct phases of sharing activity on Facebook and in public spaces, public groups, public uh, pages on Facebook um, from some very obscure um, conspiracy pages sharing this information at first to ramping up further from uh, late January onwards to another significant uh, ramp up uh, uh, towards the end of February. And then finally, a much more significant uh, growth from about mid-March onwards. And I'm highlighting here a number of the kinds of um, posts that were made during this time, the kinds of drivers that, were, that, that emerged during this time for this level of activity. Um, but really what we're seeing is particularly from mid-March onwards that celebrities are starting to get involved and they're sharing this kind of information and they're being reported about them finally as well. And, uh, and that again, significantly increases the volume of activity that we're seeing here. until finally, of course, we've got a very significant spike of activity when the arson attacks happen and when people, when news outlets are reporting about these arson attacks, when people are discussing them on Facebook and so on. As part of this, we're also seeing a very significant increase in the average size of the groups that are discussing this. We're seeing here up to about mid-March that something like a third of the pages and groups that are sharing uh, COVID 5G conspiracy theories have fewer than 10 uh, participants, 10 followers. Um, but it's from that point onwards that this, this grows quite significantly. So that by the end of our time frame here, by about mid April, we've got 90% or so of pages and groups that have more than a thousand members, a thousand followers, a thousand participants. So the, the size of communities that are starting to, to discuss this grows quite significantly, again, from about mid-March or so onwards. Um, and that has something to do, again, with celebrities and others getting involved and sharing this stuff to a much larger audience. So at that point, it breaks out of the typical hardcore conspiracy groups that are ultimately quite small and, and, and not very uh, consequential and reaches much larger audiences on Facebook. Um, the takeaways from this, from this research so far from us are that um, we do see an infodemic, as the United Nations has called it, alongside the pandemic, um, uh, really right from the, from the, the start of uh, the outbreaks, but um, it reaches really small audiences at first. The substantial spread really only begins once mainstream media amplify conspiracies, once celebrities get involved, uh, that provide content that can, can then further be amplified. Entertainment and tabloid media here are particularly significant because their journalistic standards are just much lower and they're much more uh, willing to share this conspiracy content that celebrities have posted without much criticism, without much correction. Fringe media outlets then of, of course also get involved and usually official government and corporate statements that respond to all of this arrive far too late to counteract the spread um, of uh, this kind of uh, information. Let me then move on further again uh, to another area that uh, uh, some colleagues of mine are, are focusing particularly, and that's audiovisual content um, and the, the way that that's being shared. Um, ironically, there isn't a video yet, although, although it will be there soon. And if you click on that link, you'll see the channel where it will appear. But my, my colleague Ariadna Matamoros Fernandez and her team have been doing uh, quite significant work here on the sharing of YouTube videos on Twitter, particularly again in relationship to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, so they've gathered tweets that match coronavirus on Wuhan and include a link to YouTube. Um, uh, so this is uh, for the, the first five months of 2020. And um, they've, they've gathered these tweets that link to these YouTube videos and have then grouped them into videos that are potentially viral, which means that um, many users have shared them at least once or twice. Or on the other hand, vi videos that are uh, possibly suspicious where just a few, a few users have shared them very often. Um, so these users have repeatedly and repeatedly shared the same videos over and over again. And then we've got videos in the middle that are more normally distributed um, and, and are perhaps ordinary sharing behavior. Uh, so viral videos and suspicious videos, particularly are the ones that we want to focus on here. And what they've done is to take uh, the rank flow approach of 
looking at the, the top 20 videos uh, shared, on, uh, shared on Twitter, uh, top 20 YouTube URLs shared on Twitter to understand which categories they might fall into. You're seeing very clearly there that from about mid-February onwards, suddenly we see this influx of videos that are suspicious behavior in, in the way that we've defined it here, where uh, just a handful of users are sharing uh, these videos very, very frequently, very, very often, repeatedly. Uh, and so there's a very significant shift that's, that's happening here um, that, that needs to be further explored. And in fact, the exploration that this team have, have, have done already uh, shows that this is not necessarily automated behavior. It's not necessarily ideological or commercial, but it might be a prof professionalization tactic by these sharers. Um, it's not really inauthentic behavior in that sense. It's often uh, not coordinated. It's not linked to problematic content necessarily. Um, but these, these are accounts that are, are sharing this uh, frequently for other reasons. And so platform approaches that engage with this in a way um, uh, to detect platform manipulation may not fully ad address these kinds of sharing practices. Um, these, these people sharing this might be aspiring content creators, they might be doing all sorts of other things. They're not necessarily trying to manipulate the platform, they're just trying to make themselves appear professional. And so in order to, dis to make that distinction between deceptive and non-deceptive behavior, uh, on, uh, on these platforms, we might need to focus on the content, we might need to take more sophisticated approaches to our analysis to make that distinction. Again, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to read the paper uh, and, and watch the video when it becomes available because I'm, I can only uh, describe this in very brief here, of course, but there is a, a lot of really significant, interesting research that comes through this and that needs to be uh, further recognized. Um, let me also say a little bit here about images. And again, colleagues of mine, uh, particularly my colleague Dan Angus and uh, my, my colleague Jean Burgess, have been doing a lot of work here also on Instagram. And uh, they have a blog here um, that uh, you, can, you can see by clicking on that, uh, that uh, screenshot, as well as this first article that's been published. Um, so with Instagram, uh, what they've done is to focus particularly on image classifiers to try and understand the sorts of content being shared on Instagram. And they've developed a tool called Insta Explorer that takes data from Instagram um, to uh, classify the, uh, the images that, uh, that these data sets contain. Um, this is the, the, the structure of that image machine as they've built it, and image classifier is really at the heart of all of this. Um, and ultimately, what this classifier does is to develop a hierarchy of classifications uh, for, the, for this content. Uh, so from a, a, a supercluster that contains everything, um, more and more distinct and, and, um, and defined smaller subclusters are extracted based on the shared features of these images. Um, so here's an example of how this works. Um, th this is all of, of uh, photos of the Snoop Dogg as hot dog installation. Um, and you're seeing there on the screen already that the, the image classifiers clustered all of these together as being of that installation, uh, but at the same time, it has then generated further subclusters, um, subdivided this, this full set of images into smaller sets based on shared uh, visual characteristics. So uh, in the top there, you see a cluster uh, that shows mainly straight on shots uh, with uh, close-ups. Um, in, in the bottom left, you're seeing they're mostly group images. Um, in the bottom right, you're seeing uh, long distance, exp uh, high, more highly exposed images. So these images, although they're largely of the same content of the same uh, imagery, uh, ultimately still subdivide into smaller classes. And that's what this image classifier does. So it's a very powerful tool for, for sorting these, these large data sets of Instagram images, ultimately of all kinds of images into uh, smaller and smaller subclusters for analysis. Um, and again, a, a lot of this and, and the tool itself is also being shared. So uh, again, I'd encourage you to, to explore these uh, further. Um, so here, again, we're seeing one of these subclusters in much more detail. And it's very clear that there is a lot of uh, visual similarity uh, within this subcluster well beyond the visual similarity that exists in the larger supercluster. Um, so this is a, a very exciting approach. However, and uh, here I get to the, the more critical part of uh, what I have to say, um, we're also seeing some very significant issues, of course, with this approach. Um, 
more and more, um, the research that we do, uh, particularly with platforms like Instagram, we are being pushed to scrape these platforms. Uh, we have now, for some of these platforms, reached the point where APIs are no longer available. Of course, the Instagram API itself has been very significantly um, uh, uh, curtailed and, uh, and, and crippled. Um, so uh, we may be at a point where um, API-based research on these platforms is no longer feasible. It's no longer possible. That's very problematic. Um, the pragmatic response, not just from our team, but from many research teams around the world is, of course, to develop uh, better scraping tools um, uh, to make technical advances in, in, in how we scrape, to, of course, make the code available as well and work together across teams to develop and, and update and improve these scraping tools. Um, and that's really where we've been pushed uh, ultimately by the need to uh, deal with these platforms, to research these platforms in a way that the APIs no longer allow us to do. And that, that ultimately is a, is a problematic place to be for us. And this is ultimately linked, and this is the last area that I want to talk about a little bit here. This is ultimately linked, of course, with the politics of platforms, with platform politics. Um, so the, the problem here has been that the relationships between uh, many social media platforms and researchers have been uh, changeable, um, have possibly uh, degraded in, in, in many ways, have, have declined ultimately over the years uh, for a number of these platforms. Um, there are clearly some unresolved tensions between platforms and researchers. Um, from a research perspective, and that's of course the perspective that I will represent here, um, Social media platforms are way too important to be left unscrutinized. We need to be able to research these platforms because of the significant and irreplaceable, irreplaceable role that these platforms now play in individual users' lives, but also in society as a whole. Um, so we cannot simply walk away from these platforms and, and leave them unscrutinized. They're far too important. Their impact on society is far too important. Um, we need to be able to have critical, independent public interest research on these platforms uh, because again of their importance. Um, we cannot accept and society ultimately cannot accept that the kinds of research that's possible on these platforms is shaped entirely by the directives of the platform providers. We cannot allow the providers to set limits for what we can and cannot research. Uh, those limits um, need to be set by others, not by the providers themselves who are being researched ultimately. And uh, particularly, of course, terms of service, both of platforms themselves and of the APIs, cannot trump the public interest in the research that needs to be done on these platforms. So these are significant tensions, and they've been well articulated, of course, over the last few years, um, at least since the Cambridge Analytica moment um, uh, between platforms and researchers, though not resolved, of course, at this point. Um, from a research perspective, and I speak here also as a former president of the Association of Internet Researchers, um, we have done a lot already to critically self-assess the way that we are engaging with platform data, but ultimately with user data, of course. It's not simply the data of the platforms, but the data owned by the users. Um, we have developed over the last 20 years or so, uh, some very significant and, and, and very uh, uh, detailed ethical standards, particularly through the Association of Internet Researchers, uh, for dealing with um, user information from these platforms, for dealing with personal, per, personally identifiable information from these platforms in particular. Um, and we've developed the, the, the data and, and sharing practices um, that we need to deal with these data carefully, cautiously, uh, in an appropriate way. Um, we've taken, I think, great care to demonstrate uh, as a community of researchers that we can be trusted with the data. Um, it's not quite clear at this point, and I know we've got a number of representatives of the platform providers uh, on this panel, and I think many of them will recognize this as well. It's not really quite clear at this point, I think, um, what level of commitment different platform providers have to working with the research community. We've seen some positive steps um, from Twitter, for instance, now making uh, available a, a, a dedicated uh, point of access for researchers uh, to Twitter data. We've seen um, some positive and some negative steps on the Facebook side. We've seen, of course, the closure of the Instagram API, essentially. Um, so depending on the platform, the, the situation is quite different. Um, and this is, I think, a conversation that we need to continue to have, and we need to continue to argue from a research point of view for better access to platform data. Um, 
uh, and uh, for better models of access to platform data. Um, and this needs to be a, a conversation amongst equals rather than uh, one that's dictated by the platforms themselves. Um, so if, if I may uh, uh, end this uh, presentation then with uh, a point of, uh, from history, um, you may know that in the, at the height of the Roman Republic, uh, the speaker, the Senator Carter the Elder, ended each speech in the Senate with this statement, which, which translates as, uh, furthermore, I propose that Carthage is to be destroyed. Uh, so he really tried to hammer home his point every time he made a speech uh, that, that Rome needed to do something about, uh, about Carthage. Now, we're not in such a belligerent um, uh, relationship uh, between the research community and uh, uh, the platform providers themselves. But for us as researchers, I think it's also important uh, to, to bring home this point wherever we can. Uh, that social media platforms must provide data access to research that is critical, independent, and in the public interest. Um, we cannot be in a position where that kind of research is no longer possible because APIs has been, have been shut down, because data access has been shut down. So um, we certainly in the research community will continue to argue for significant access to uh, platform data in a safe and appropriate way, obviously. Um, but we will continue to argue for this, uh, this level of access. And uh, we hope that on the platform side, we will continue to have um, people that we can engage with on this point and uh, a, a way to negotiate that level of access. I think this is now more crucial than ever, particularly in the current context, um, both from a political point of view, but also from the, uh, the point of view of mis and disinformation, of course, that we are talking here. Uh, largely, we need to be in a position where we can actually research these phenomena and where we can help find solutions to, this, to these phenomena that takes the platforms and independent research together rather than just the platforms alone. So with this, I'll finish. I have to thank quite a large number of funders for the various projects I've talked about. And uh, of course, I, I very much hope that this can be the start of a longer um, uh, conversation over time. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, having me as part of this panel. And uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to continue this conversation. Thank you.